Uh, my name is Chuck Keeney. I'm with the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum, and this is the first edition of our Mine Wars Forum. This is going to be a series that we're going to do all summer in light of the fact that the museum cannot be open due to the coronavirus, and there's a lot of events that we want to share with uh, the general public. So one of the things I'm going to be doing all summer is meeting and talking with different historians, writers, maybe some artists and other people involved with the museum in order to bring Mind Wars content to you uh, because you can't come to Mate One. And of course, one of the big events that uh, we want to deal with is the 100th anniversary of the Mate One Massacre or Battle of Mate One or Gunfight at Mate One, however you want to title that. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. But for our first edition, I have with me Dr. David Allen Corbin, and I'm thrilled to have Dr. Corbin here with me. Uh, he is, in my opinion, the Dean of Mine Wars Historians. His book, Life, Work, and Rebellion in the Coal Fields, was the first book that I ever read about the Mine Wars when I was a teenager. By the way, I still have my um, copy of it right here that I had when I was a teenager. It's about to fall apart, actually. But, uh, and he also, of course, was uh, uh, published the West Virginia Mind Wars Anthology, of course, which was later renamed Gun Thugs, uh, Rednecks, and Radicals. And uh, got a copy of that one here, too. But uh, I still think that your work, uh, Life, Work, and Rebellion, is the standard uh, by which all other Mind Wars books are measured. And I'm teaching an online Mind Wars course at West Virginia Wesleyan College this fall. And your book is my standard text that I'm using. So I think it's still uh, the best book out there. And I'm thrilled to have you here with me to uh, talk about the centennial of the Make One Massacre. So Dr. Corbin, thanks for joining me. A pleasure, glad to be here. Well, great. Um, well, before we get uh, 100 years back, I want to go back about 40 years or so to when you were a master's student at Marshall University. We both got our masters at the same place, by the way, which uh, is a good thing. So tell me about when you first uh, began to become interested in the mine wars and your early research there. Uh, I have to point out that uh, when I first started, Chuck, there's absolutely nothing on the on the mine wars. I came at this completely ignorant. Um, mine wars have been left out of our history books, left out of our classes. You know, Marshall uh, had course in Latin American history and on Southeast Asia history, but nothing on Western labor history, especially the mine wars. Um, it's a complete void. Nothing written. When I was at the library one day, Marshall Library, one of the librarians who I knew quite well, and always talking with her, she put me on this microfilm of a labor newspaper in Huntington, the Socialist Labor Star. And she thought, given your interest, you might be interested in this. So I started, took it, started reading the newspaper, down about what I was reading. Um, quickly learned in public schools in West Virginia, learned about Biscuit Rebellion, Bacon's Rebellion, all these other rebellions across the country. Never heard a thing about far larger and to me a much more important rebellion in our own state. And it's just been left out of our history books and left out of our schools. Uh, as I was reading the Social Labor Star, I was just astounded about what I was reading about the Hay Creek, Cam Creek Strike. I should say I later learned that the, this labor newspaper was was started for the purpose of getting information out, out about the Pain Creek and Creek strike. Um, the AP dispatcher uh, in Pain Creek and Creek Military District, the AP dispatcher was the very head of the court martial system. He's one court marching all the coal miners. So that's why he was controlling the information that came out of the coal fields. And um, that's why the, uh, the two labor newspapers that were established the Social Labor Star in Huntington and Labor Argus in Charleston were so important. They were getting, getting the information out of the Marshall Law Center. And that led me to a missing issue of the paper as I was reading through the paper. It was a weekly newspaper, the Social Labor Star's weekly newspaper. All of a sudden, there's an issue missing. Gone. They didn't publish it for that week. Um, hmm. As I kept reading through the newspaper, I found out why the governor had suppressed this, um, that issue of the newspaper. He called the militia out of the Marshall Law Zone, sent it to Huntington, 50 miles away to Huntington, and they came in middle middle of the night, smashed the presses, and incarcerated the editor. 
actually he ran off to Kentucky to escape them. Eventually they caught him and put him in jail for a few days and they yeah. suppressed the newspaper. So, so they're trying to hide the story even while the story itself was developing. Absolutely. So yeah. they were doing it for the most part, except for these two labor newspapers getting the story out. And like I said, I just, was just down by what I was reading about the Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike, what the newspaper is saying, and really sparked my interest in, that's my initiation to the mine wards, the Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike. So I continued to pursue it. Actually, what I started doing was driving up, um, my family lives in Dunbar. So when I had a chance, I'd go to Dunbar, then when I had an opportunity, I'd drive up to Cabin Creek and look for older miners to talk to them about the Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike. They, a lot of them remembered it and they talked to me about it and, um, and told me other stuff was going on vaguely. My mother, who was a nurse for a private doctor, she put me onto one of her patients, one of the doctor's patients. He's an elderly African-American man, Rogers Mitchell. Mm -hmm. 80, I think it was about 86 or 89 at the time. And he'd come in, they'd talk about, uh, he'd talk about coal mining at, at the early days. And, Mom thought I'd be interested in talking to him, so I went visiting. He lived in the Institute at the time, and Chuck, he was just incredible. I got hours and hours of tape with him. Yeah. Uh, he'd lived through everything. He'd migrated up from South Carolina. Uh, he was brought in, actually, as a strike breaker. Then he found out what was going on, so he crossed the line and joined the strikers. But the, uh, he eventually, he was not involved in the main one massacre, but he knew about it. Shoot out as he caught up. Shoot out down there. Mingo County. Yeah. Big one. Big one. And he'd tell me about that. And, you know, stunned while I was hearing then he's then he was in the March on Logan. And um he had eloquence to him too. Um, um I asked him about Mother Jones one time. I, I knew very little about Mother Jones this time, but I heard of her asking about Mother Jones. He just looks at me very solemnly and goes, As long as it's a coal miner, she'll never be forgotten. Mm. Once the coal miners should never be forgotten. Uh, I started talking about um, the March on Logan. He tells me about that. He goes, we, we just got on top of the Blair Mountain. We got on top of Blair Mountain. And where you go into Logan, somebody says, you'll never get in there. You'll never get into Logan. I says, why? And, and I asked why. He, they said, because he got the United States Army in there. I said, you're kidding. Got the United States Army in there. And um, that just really sparked my interest. Um, Eventually, I did find Howard Lee's book, Bloodletting Appalachia, which helped give some of the background to the material. Um, he had such a pejorative, condescending tone toward the miners that it was not a book to be taken too, too seriously, but it was a good introduction, overall introduction. But that's was the spark that started my obsession. I did a master's thesis on uh, the Charleston Social Circle in the 30s, which covered the Western Mine Workers Union. And I just determined to do this study on the miners. Yeah, and uh, you went to mate one also, didn't you? Um, for my research for Life Work Rebellion, yeah. After I chose this as my dissertation topic, somewhat reluctant, I thought maybe too big for a graduate student to handle, but then I didn't get interested in anything else. I decided I talked to my PhD advisor and on this topic. He goes, That's where your interest is, that's where your love is, go for it. So I did, um, did a lot of interviewing and came back and stayed with my parents and went down to Logan County first. Mm -hmm. And I was stunned there. A few older miners kind of remembered the Battle of Blair Mountain, but nobody really talked to me. Very few people would actually talk to me. The startling thing, younger people down Logan had never heard of it. They did not know about it. It's been left out of their textbooks as well. The older folks did not talk to them about it. Elmets got the feeling that they were ashamed of it, embarrassed by what happened, and ashamed of their history. When I went over to make one, I really got a, a dose of it because absolutely well, when we go county to research that I'll make one, nobody would talk to me. I mean, it was just stone cold silence. Nobody would talk to me. And I quit carrying my tape recorder around, thinking maybe I was they were intimidated by the tape recorder. Uh -huh. And I still didn't get anywhere. So I finally ran into an elderly barber, old barber, and he started telling me about to, or telling me about the shootout. He saw, he convinced me he did see the gunfight. Hmm. Uh, uh, he convinced me, and I was asking if I could come back the next day with my tape recorder. He goes, "Yeah, sure. Come 
bring your tape recorder. Be glad to talk to me about. It. So I go back the next day for that tape recorder. He wouldn't talk to me. He shut up. He goes, <laughs> I don't remember anything. I was too young. I was too young to remember anything. I don't know anything. He just he, somebody got to him. Somebody told him don't talk to me or either that or he didn't want to put it on record. I, I don't know. But he would not. I, I, I didn't get anywhere talking about a mate woman. Yeah, it, it's crazy how. Uh, that many years later, people are still afraid to talk about it. Uh, when I was in high school, I was able to interview some of Frank Heaney's surviving children. And I know, of course, you, you did that also. You interviewed my grandfather. Um, and there were even things that they wouldn't tell me, or they would make me turn my tape recorder off before they would tell me. And I'm like, I'm family, and you <laughs> want to talk to me about this. Uh, years later, so I had to pull teeth to get them to talk to me, and it took over time before even they would, would reveal things. And it's amazing how, even among the participants, you would think that you, they would want to shout some of this stuff from the rooftops, but they were still silent, even, you know, 50, 60 years later. Now, so much hostility every which way, and so much suspicion, paranoia. Um, one thing might be affecting what you're talking about is, um, in the 1930s, when Frank Heaney comes back and forms the Western State Mine Workers Union, John L. Lewis started his massive hate Kennedy propaganda campaign mm -hmm. and uh, just really tore into him and um, created all this hatred in coal fields toward Frank Heaney. Right. And your family resented it for obvious reasons. So, um, yeah, yeah. He was not uh, John L. Lewis's uh, favorite. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> District president, that's for sure. And and he got painted as a dual unionist in the 30s, you know, with the West Virginia mine workers. And, and you know, there's still some residue of that today, you know, still to some old school union guys that don't look upon Frank Heaney that well uh, because uh, of his uh, attempt in the Great Depression, you know, to start his own union. Yeah. And Arnold Miller became president of MW. Uh, Edward Miller uh, during the Miners for Democracy effort, and afterwards, so I was talking about, I was talking with President Miller, and mentioned to him about Frank Keeney, and he knew Keeney, and he uh, he actually knew quite a bit about the Western Mine Workers Union. And I suggest the UMW um, dedicated a tombstone to him, have a ceremony, and recognize UMW's death, Frank Keeney, and he liked the idea. He was going to go for it. Said with his family, so I came back and I talked to you grandfather, I think, Charles Belmont, yeah. your grandfather about it, thinking he'd be excited. He wasn't. Right. He had a very cold shoulder. He didn't like the idea. And yeah. um, I think it goes back to all the hatred that Lewis generated toward Frank King. He didn't get involved in it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of bitter feelings that, you know, went down through the generations. But let's get back to mate one. I could talk about the the, the third. Sorry. Maybe, maybe we can bring you back another time and talk about uh, the Great yeah. Depression, because I love that period. Uh, there's not enough done uh, on that, uh, you know, into the 30s. Uh, so, and I could talk about that all night, too. Uh, but um, mate one, getting back to mate one. So here we are 100 years later, and uh, there's all these other dramatic events of the mine work. You know, the gunfights at Mucklow, you've got uh, the Volmook Special, you've got the three-day battle of the Tug, which may have killed 30-plus people. We still don't know how many people died. That's just incredible. I mean, it was a three-day battle fought right there. But Mate One is what everybody remembers outside of Blair Mountain itself. Why do you think that is? Why, why Mate One? Why does that one event stand out so much? Thanks. Cool it. it was first I pointed out, it's really great to point out all these other battles which are going on because I've really encouraged people, don't look at any single event, any single episode, you have to look at the total picture. You see, get lost with the trees, you got to look at the forest, keep the forest in mind. That's what's important. This is a three-year insurrection, the regional insurrection. It's not a mate one insurrection. Mate one was part of a larger picture and um, Part of a, lot, lot, a larger picture, like I said, the three days battle. It, that battle went along the 10 mile front. It's incredible. As Frank King said they're bringing bodies out of the woods for eight days. Yeah. Um, they, we still don't know for sure how many people were killed, but um, that, um, they had made one uh, shootout, made one, or battle made one, May 19th, 1920. You also had a gunfight at uh, War Eagle. The very next day was a major gunfight at Merrimack. 
I mean, this was just a three-year war, insurrection, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think one stands south of it's probably most visible and most dramatic of the battles up until Blair Mountain. This is where the miners, led by the chief of police, Sid Hatfield, really stood up to the Baldwin Fells. The Baldwin Fells guards were the very embodiment of um, uh, anti unionism in southern West Virginia. And the treatment of the miners for uh, two decades, which is so brutal, so ugly, the way they treat the miners. And here, the miners stood up to him, led by Chief Police, uh, Sid, Sid Hatfield, stood up to him and said, Mad as hell, we're not going to take it anymore. And the gun battle ensued, and they killed seven of the 11 Baldwin Fells guards who were sent in. But just take the whole scenario the arrogance on part of the Baldwin Fells guards. They'd had their own way so long with the miners. They, they just came in to make one, and marched right down Main Street carrying their high-powered rifles and um, they defy the mayor of the town, the chief police of the town, they throw the miners out of their houses and Hatfield stands up and goes, not in my town, you know, not in my town, this is my town, these are my people, stands up to them and like I said, the gun battle ensues and they uh, kill seven of the 11 Old Fells guards and this one time the powers that be did not win. Um, yeah. Which makes out of team itself worth remembering. Yeah, it, it has it has of course this kind of old western setup to it. You know, you it had these like OK Corral kind of vibes to it. Uh, you know, this meeting by the railroad tracks. You know, and by the depot, kind of uh, that atmosphere. But I, I think you're you're right on target as far as why it was so significant because even today when you think of elected officials you think of law enforcement you, you, uh, people still today in west virginia well they're in the pockets of the coal industry they're going to do whatever the coal industry wants they're going to enforce what the coal companies want uh from uh, from state police down to the board of education you know that even today and it's such a rarity to see a law enforcement uh, official and a mayor standing up uh, for the miners. And now you did see that in Eskdale uh, during Paint Creek and Cabin Creek because they had a, a socialist mayor uh, down there. But uh, it's such a rarity that a law enforcement officer and a mayor are taking the miner's side as opposed to the coal company's side. And the, you know that brings us to Sid Hatfield himself uh, who's, you know, still yet a controversial figure today, but uh, to the miners, he was a folk hero. And you, th you, you think he deserves that reputation a as a hero? Yes, without question. Um, he's one who willing to stand up to the miners, stand against the repression that was going on. And he, he took them on right there in the main street of town and showed the miners that you can win this thing. Um, that's why Make One so significant does stand out because uh, Keeney called the strike, Mingo County strike, he calls it in the spring of 1920. It was going well with him. He established 34 locals, I think, by the time the, the shootout at Make One established 34. But after the Make One massacre, miners just flocked to the Union by July. A month and a half later, 90% of the miners in Mingo County take the Union oath. We really felt they finally had Mingo County. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you did, things just exploded right after uh, after the gunfight at Mate One. Now, there's a lot of controversy over what happened uh, in the moments leading up, and everybody has their own version. You mentioned Howard B. Lee. Uh, Howard B. Lee uh, thinks that Patfield was the one that shot first. Uh, in fact, I believe he says that the dentist of Mate One told him that Hatfield shot first, but everybody has their own idea of who shot first. Uh, of course, the coal companies uh, wanted to spread the story that Hatfield shot the mayor so he could be with the mayor's wife, and then, you know, he was actually this scoundrel kind of figure. Um, what do you think happened? I really haven't investigated that. Well, I don't get into the mechanics of May 1, the battle may one or even march on Logan, I take up to the event itself and and uh, don't look at the mechanics. We, there's so much we just don't know. But um, if you ask me what I think, uh, 
do not believe Tom Felt's propaganda. Uh, it's one thing I do not believe. Um, right. It's much of it was generated by Feltz and this machine there. Um, if was, if Hadfield was determined to, uh, he, he's going to shoot first or he, the setup, he's not going to take the mayor of the town out there whooping. The idea that he set up the mayor to kill the mayor. I mean, he's in a gun battle with 11 Baldwin guards. You're not going to take time to uh, shoot. Right. The mayor of the town. Right. He can shoot him any day. That's me. Right. Uh, and with, you know, and with everybody Felt's there uh, to see it, uh, also because uh, the whole town would have seen it uh, right. um, had he done that. And also, you know, for those that are the Baldwin Feltz apologists out there uh, that want to paint Sid uh, as this, you know, cold-blooded murderer or whatever. Albert Feltz and C.B. Cunningham, two of, uh, of the Feltz uh, detectives that were there, you know, these were guys that led the attack on Ludlow, uh, the tent colony in Colorado six years earlier that killed uh, close, to, close to 30, uh, I think 25 uh, to 30 were killed. A lot of them women and children uh, that uh, died in the fire of the tent colony. So Cunningham and, and Feltz, you know, had some serious blood on their hands anyway going into this. And, uh, you know, they had a kind of a live by the sword, die by the sword kind of poetic justice there. But, but uh, they're kind of, they weren't going to terrorize any more tent colonies after this day. So um, the, the, there's still controversy about the, you know, the, there's uh, a descendant uh, of the Baldwins, uh, that uh, Baldwin fellow that shows up in our museum in Maywan uh, every now and then and tries to, uh, really? his version of the story every now and then. <laughs> uh, so, so we still deal with a little bit of that today. But uh, I think uh, that particularly, you know, since your book came out and over the last 30 years or so, I think the, the wheels turned a little bit and we're finally uh, getting that story out there. Let me point out, let me point out Chuck, um, uh, the, one of the bottom felt to escape the uh, the shootout, Oscar Bennett. Uh, it's actually, I don't know if you consider him a relative of mine or not. Um, his daughter married my uncle, my mother's brother. Okay. So, yeah, Oscar Bennett. And it, it, it's interesting, though. Um, yeah, he did escape. And she, I talked to Ian about it. Like I say, it was his, her father. They got married in Bramwell. And uh, that's where they lived. It, it's interesting to talk to her because she never would talk to anybody in the family about growing up as a child of a Baldwin Feltz agent. Right. Uh, and they're like, in the family, after they saw my book, <laughs> they started dreading what she's going to say about my book. But actually, she read my book, and we were at breakfast one morning um, during a family reunion. I was talking to her, and all of a sudden, she just opened up with me. I wish they had a tape recorder. I didn't. Hmm. She opened up what it was like being a child of a Baldwin Feltz agent growing up in the coal fields. And, Family had to move to Bramwell because she was being harassed so much by the miners' kids. No, oh. you know, it's cool. It gave me, a, I don't say a different perspective, but kind of insight that I never had before. And talk about, like, say, the hatred her dad generated, and not only, you know, I guess, like father, like daughter, the hatred, you know, toward her too. Like, say, the family moved to Bramwell, and that's where she got married. Married my uncle, and it was interesting to say the least. Yeah. Oh, what's interesting? She told me, she told me it's her dad who jumped into Tug River to escape uh, to escape the shooting, whereas Howard Lee Sims was another. Howard Lee identifies some old Bonfeld agents who were there, names him Oscar Bennett being there, and said things says another agent was one who swam across the river. So I don't know who's right on that one. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But that would have been a great conversation to have. But it, I think it all it continuously comes back to the mine guards, to the Baldwin felt agents, because uh, you can argue back and forth about who had the proper warrant for who, you know, Sid threw out a warrant for Feltz and Feltz threw out a warrant for Sid, or you can argue about what happened up to the moment of the first shot, but we're talking about decades of systematic brutality that the mine guards uh, had visited up upon the miners and the way they had taken away their freedoms of assembly and of speech and of the right to organize and, and all this. So it was built up over a lot of time. I guess that's one reason I don't get into the mechanics that much because 
these events like Bear Mountain as well as many one, they're going to happen. Uh, it might be another town, might be in Eskil, some other town, but it's going to happen. The hatred was there. It's just building up, they get building up, and it's going to explode someplace. As uh, pointed out before, uh, uh, Blair Mountain was going to happen. It just happened to be Logan County, but it might be in Raleigh County, Fayette County, uh, Mingo County. Blair Mountain was going to happen. Human beings can only tolerate so much oppression and exploitation. They will rebel. They will revolt. That's the cause of Blair Mountain as well as a uh, that off May one. So they say I'm more interested in where these events come from, how they happened, rather than not the mechanics of how they happened. So yeah, you're right. Uh, and uh, something had to give. Uh, exactly. And May one just exactly. wanted to be the place where it gave uh, in Mingo County. So. We're at, well, here we are 100 years later. Um, by the way, how, what do you call it? Uh, a lot of people call it the Mate One Massacre. Some people call it the Battle of Mate One. I've been referring to it lately as the gunfight because I think calling it a battle, I mean, like the three day battle of the tug, that was a battle. You know, uh, when I think of a battle, I think of almost, uh, you know, organized forces, you know, uh, it's, and massacre discussing. What do you call this event? Do you call it a massacre? Do you call it a battle? Do you call it a gunfight? Where do you come down on that, David? My preference is battle of May 1. Uh, uh, or May 1 massacre. I really do my best trying to get everybody away from May 1 massacre. It's Tom Feltz's description. The miners win one, becomes a massacre. Um, shootout or gunfight, um, it's like, between a cop and a bank robber or two neighbors hate each other, you start shooting each other, that's a gunfight. But, you know, there's really political principles involved uh, that make one that mm -hmm. take, transcends a gunfight and puts it in a higher category. They're fighting for universal values and principles and stuff. And um, so it's more than a gunfight. And more, you know, Helen was battled Lexington. Probably not more than an hour, you know, the colonials took to the British and drove them off. So my preference is battle, make one. Right. Okay. So official word in is gun is battle of make one. Okay. That's my word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll go with battle of make one. I, I do agree that, that uh, massacre is very loaded. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, uh, Tom Feltz's notion of what happened. And of course, the propaganda machines really got going right after that. And I think also with the media, the way the media portrayed it, it didn't help that Sid Hatfield's last name was Hatfield also. Good point. Uh, and this was right at the spot uh, where a lot of the Hatfield-McCoy feuds uh, events happened. So they were able to very quickly slip into that backward violent mountaineer stereotype and use that as the cause, as opposed to the oppression of the miners, uh, the mine guard system, and all of those things. Industrial warfare. It was industrial warfare in class, I want to say class conflict. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely, uh, you know, even at Blair Mountain, it was divided along class lines. So, you know, a lot of times where your allegiances were. So, yeah, and even the, the witnesses that sided with uh, the Feltzes uh, in the trial, like the, the uh, dentist that uh, Howard B. Lee quotes that says that Hatfield fired first, you know, the professional class often sided with the company uh, in, in a lot of these conflicts that took place. So, yeah, battle of May 1. So let's do one more question here, and then we can wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and try to try to finish this up smoothly. So it's a hundred years later. What does this mean to us now? A uh, hundred years later. What do you think? I think it's important for us to recognize this symbolic, uh, the symbolism of Mate One, hundred years later. Uh, what it really stood for: get away from the violence, the concentration on the violence. The, really what stood for, what these guys were fighting for. And May 1, like I say, it's just a microcosm of what was going on throughout Southern West Virginia, the insurrection. And um, uh, 
We remember Lexington and Concord not because people fought and died there, but what it's represented the, the colonial standing up to British oppression and exploitation. It's what the miners were doing during this um, three year insurrection, and up to finally saying up to the coal companies. And, uh, it takes um, form and make one in Battle of Blair Mountain, but uh, it was a three year, like I say, struggle. And that's what we've got to remember about it. And like I say, remember May 1, as we remember Lexington and Concord, as symbolic moments in the in a larger picture, a scheme of things. You know, just uh, you, you want to say democratic, the strive for democratic rights, principles, um, a more just and humane industrial order. Um, there's just really a lot of higher ground to it that May 1 symbolizes. And, I think that's what should be keeping in mind. Again, yeah. um, think of it that way. Yeah, I love the fact that you make the lexicon and, and Concord tie in there with the you know Revolutionary War, uh, because uh, it's it's a tie in that I make in writings that I've made about the mine wars, and uh, it was that December, in fact, that the Lick Creek Tent Colony, a reporter for the Nation, came and visited that uh, tent colony and referred to the tent colony as Labor's Valley Forge. And I don't think it's, a, it's an accident that the miners themselves along Paint Creek and Cadham Creek, uh, they referred to their little fighting units as Minutemen, uh, just like during the Revolutionary War, uh, because this was about liberty and it was about freedom. And I think that we need to remember that uh, in the same sense or in the same breath as with the, the Patriots uh, in Bo outside of Boston or the Sons of Liberty uh, because they were fighting for their constitutional rights. And the notion that people just had their constitutional rights after the Constitution was written is really a myth of American history because the fight for constitutional rights, I think, has been continual and ongoing for many groups. Uh, and the mine wars is this uh, industrial example of that continuing struggle. Because there's just work in progress. You're absolutely right. Um, Senator Burton always had these discussions. He's a big constitutionalist and talked to him one time saying it wasn't, con wasn't perfect. Senator wasn't perfect. Uh, I recognized slavery in different three different places and had a lot of problems. It was a white male document. Yes, yes, but she also uh, had amendments, allowed amendments for it to adjust through time. The founders knew this was not a perfect document. That's why they allowed for amendments to so it could be adjusted through time. But um in what we're talking about, um, I remember Bruce Canton, the Civil War historian Bruce Canton describing Antietam, Battle of Antietam, said these thousands of men did not die to act a, a bloody path and a bloody three mile path. They died so this country could go on and uh, could go on and, and fulfill its promise. And I like that. And it, that's what I mean, Mate wants all about. Um, it's like, say, a symbolic moment transitional moment in a larger scheme of things and struggle in human existence. Yeah, yeah, couldn't said it better. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining me here uh, for our very first Mind Wars Forum. Uh, for those of you that uh, will watch this online, if you want to uh, see more uh, content like this, uh, there will be a link provided where you can go to our museum and uh, support the museum through uh, becoming a member or by donating to the museum or we have an online store where you can buy mugs, t-shirts, we have Sid Hatfield t-shirts, caps, and all kinds of other things that you can support our museum in this time where we're not able to have our doors open and uh, you can help us out in, in a different way. David, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm um, so happy we were able to do our first one with you uh, to talk about this huge event, and uh, I just wish, uh, our, uh, <laughs> technically, we were I, I was a little more savvy with all this, but hopefully that'll improve over time. Just to, before you go today, I do want to say, I saw the view, Portsmouth University Press catalog today, I saw you have a book coming out in it. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I do have one coming out next, uh, in January of next year. And um, who knows, maybe somebody will even read it. Uh, <laughs> Everybody uh, interested, I can tell you. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. And take care and stay safe.
Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks again for the invite. Thank you.